year. The first took place last year um, where I was invited to be a speaker on a Sunday morning at St. Gregory's Church here in Boca Raton. The church was uh, beginning a, an $8 million fund driving, fundraising drive for a big renovation, which they, um, they're in the midst of right now. And by the way, they're almost, they've almost reached their targeted goal. So I call HaKavod Lachem. So they asked me to speak, and it happened to be the Sunday of the holy day in the Christian world known as Pentecost. Pentecost, you know, comes from the word from 50. And I realized that Pentecost, and I had not never knew this before, but that Pentecost is the equivalent of Shavuot, where this is, if we were still counting, this is the night after the 49th day of the counting of the Omer, so obviously there's some connection between Shavuot and, and Pentecost. And what I learned about Pentecost was it is the time where when the Holy Spirit was received, the Holy Spirit of the, the Son of God in Christian thought, in, Christian, in, Christian, in the Christian narrative. And so when I was thinking about what to talk about that morning, I decided that I would teach them about Shavuot and the parallel between Shavuot and Pentecost. And that being that it is through Torah that we receive the spirit as it were, that we're tied together as a people with God through Torah. One of the uh, um, things that so many of our congregants have experienced in the Torah writing project that we're doing is that we're doing the Torah scribing under a chuppah. And we're doing it under a chuppah because we understand that the Torah is, the Torah is the ketubah. It's the ketubah that ties a people, it ties a people to its God. And that essentially that which we all hold in common is that Torah. Because I know we believe different things, not just conservative Jews and reform Jews, from reformed Jews and Orthodox Jews, etc. But each of us hold on to different beliefs and I think if we're all honest with ourselves, we would say that throughout our lives, we believe in different ways. But the thing that doesn't change is that we hold on to one Torah, that we hear the reading of the Torah together every Shabbat. I had this other experience years and years ago in Yerushalayim when I went to a, a rather um, old uh, Bratzlaver show for Shabbat morning service. And in that service, there were a couple of things that I recall. One was that the mechitza between the men and women in that particular show was in the back of the men's section. And it wasn't a curtain, it was a wall. A wall was built that had about six inches from the ceiling. And the women were in that other side and they couldn't even enter in through the men's section. I also recall that by and large, everybody was davening at their own pace. And so people were saying different words at different times. And it was very, and people were walking around as they were davening. And it felt very, um, both discordant and it felt very disorganized. And I knew the following week I was coming back to B'nai Torah, where we sing together right, where we sit in our seats, we stand at the same time, we sit at the same time, and there's this orderliness to it. And I felt this sense of alienation from that experience in that it felt like such a different religious experience than the one that we share on Shabbat or anytime at B'nai Torah. But what I realized is that we held something very deeply um, in common, and that is that we read the same Torah. That Shabbat, they read the same Parsha that we read. That Shabbat, people came up to the Torah, or men came up to the Torah, and did the same Aliyot. So that Torah is that which unifies us as a people, and that Torah is that which is the, the conduit that we have to God. So we can have other types of religious experiences, very personal religious experiences that are each of our, for each of us, they can be different. But the one that we share, the one that holds us together is the Torah. 
I will be talking about this a lot over the next few months, certainly over the holidays. And that is the power of the scribing experience that we have seen. I've been involved with Torah writing experiences before, but ne I've never personally sat through as many um, events, as many scribings as I have this time. And I've been involved in teaching at those moments also. And I see what it means for people to write in the Torah. Because when they write in that Torah, they understand that they're connecting their, that moment to something that's very deep from their own past. Could have to do with parents, parents who are deceased, grandparents, great-grandparents. It could have to do with the history of our people. Or it could have to do with the fact that writing that letter in a Torah, they're writing a letter in a Torah that's going to be there for their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren. It is it's an extraordinarily powerful connector for our people and for the meaning of our people. The thing that I am, well, I, I think one of the things, at another, at another time, I'll tell you some of the others, but the, one of the things I'm so proud of, of what we've achieved at B'nai Torah as a conservative congregation over these years has to do with the numbers of learners that we have. The number of people who come to lectures who come to adult education classes, who study, who studied with Rabbi Englander, study with me, study in Melton, studied in the Hartman program, study with the variety of teachers, including Rabbi Reamer, and what a gift we have that Rabbi Reamer is in our presence teaching. It is really magnificent. And it is really part of the, the, the core, the core strength and power of our wonderful congregation. And we are, after all, B'nai Torah. We're the children of Torah. Tonight we celebrate that, and we celebrate that with our own learners. And that's why I thought when we began to talk about what we're going to do for the Tikkun this year, that it would be great to have some of the people who learn in our congregation to share some of their learning. My fear at first was that we'd have too many people and that it would go on beyond sunrise tomorrow. My second fear after a couple of days after announcing it was that we wouldn't have enough, but it worked out. We have just enough people and we're really happy to hear from each and to every one of you. By the way, I'm happy to see some of you that I haven't seen in a while. And some of you who are here during the season and are now back in places up north, we are very fortunate. We're very lucky to be part of this wonderful community. So tonight, our very first teacher, is going to be Franklin Kreutzer. And um, I don't know if you know this about Frank, but Frank is a past president of the United Synagogue of Conservative Judaism, a man who's known, truly known nationally throughout our movement, has given so much of his life to his synagogue and to, and to um, conservative Judaism. And uh, he's been a a regular part of us for many years now, and it's an honor to have Frank with us. So to, Frank is going to teach about the Torah shall shall it. Frank, where are you? There you are. You have to unmute. There you go. Um, does this microphone work? Very well. All right, usually it comes in as Mickey Mouse the first time around. We, we know. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Rabbi. <laughs> first of all, um, the rabbi stole my opening line already how grateful we are and how lucky we are to have Rabbi Jack Reamer on, because I've studied with him for at least 50 years, uh, read about him before I knew who he was even, um, and it's magnificent. So don't let my presentation scare you away. Please stick around because I assure you that you're up for a soaring great experience. Having said that, um, the instruction that, you, that I applied for was Tell us about a Torah text that interested you or you think you could share. Well, I got stuck by saying, I want to talk about the Shal Shalit, but that puts me on four um, texts. So we'll do it as quickly as we can. First of all, what is a Shal Shalit? Um, if you saw it, you would get an eraser and immediately remove it from either the piece of paper or the artwork or wherever it was. It is a, a Torah cantillation. It's a Torah truck. It's a note, it's a notation that tells us how a sound should be made. It's equivalent in effect to, a, to music staff uh, 
um, FACE, ECBDF, put a sharp on it, put a flat on it. It tells you how to make a sound. Now, that particular note, that particular trop called a shall shell it, uh, which means chain, um, looks like a um, squiggly line vertically, very, very narrow. It in effect goes from the bottom going up. You would say it's squiggly, you would say it's a wiggle, uh, a zigzag. Um, the concept, I think, because for most questions, if you would ask me, I'll learn a phrase that Rabbi Reamer taught me a long time ago when he said, I don't know. Frequently, he even used the phrase, we don't know when you study with him and you learn so much. So much of what I'm going to tell you tonight in the very short period of time I've got is that we don't know, I don't know. The words upon which this single shall shall it note is, they're very clear. They're good in Hebrew, you understand that in English they get different translations, but they're still pretty clear. But when you put a shall shall it on it, it makes you think. You have to figure out what it's like. So they're on the share screen now, you see the four different times, four times of the whole Torah, this note appears. In Genesis, it's three times and once in Leviticus. And it deals with four people, four characters, if you will, um, in, the, in the Torah. Lot, Eliezer, who is not named, only we know who the person is, Joseph and Moses. So the sound of it we'll discuss at the very end, but it is similar to three posers. And poser is one of the toughest notes that there are the one has to sing. Roughly there are 30 notes in it, and it's a going up and up and up and down. It really gets your attention. So I don't know what your philosophy is and your belief is of from whence cometh the Torah, it cometh from the, the mouth of the Lord, cometh from inspired people. Um, is it something that is divine, inspirational, or is it a verbatim, alliterated and punctuated uh, document? In the Torah, there are no punctu punctuations, but there is it in our Chumash that comes directly from, from heaven. But I have bigger concerns and interests. Where did the marks come from? Who decided? to put this shall shall it, which I'm going to give you examples of in a moment, decide to put it on this word, not on another word. So we were first look at Genesis chapter 19, verse 16, where we deal with Lot. Uh, you remember the story of Lot, the, um, the city is burning, he has to leave, he has to leave. The angel comes and grabs him by hand and says, let's get out of here because we got to get you out of Sin City. Sin City is my phrase, but that was the concept of what the angel was saying. And the Torah word says, still he delayed. Well, that's pretty clear. He stayed. Well, why did he stay? And that's what they tell you about. He was struggling. That shall shall it tells you that there's, that can't make up my mind what is the right thing to do. Well, we clearly know he was possessed by possessions. He was leaving everything he had behind and he had plenty. Or, and that's where the one-handed economist comes out, right? Every economist says on the other hand, and we wanna know the right answer, not what the other hand is. Um, maybe it was an emotional experience on his part. How do you leave your homeland? How do you leave the place of your birth or the place of your family? Or was he really concerned about his possessions? And he didn't care if he lived among the Sin City crowd. So the word is there pretty clear. Still, he delayed. But why did he delay? The Shalshala tells us, tells us, the student, tells us, the Jew in the pew, understand this, look at it. Plenty of views on both sides of this question dealing with Lot from black to white, white to black, and all kinds of shades of gray. So that's the first example of where a shall shall it appears. 
Next, we go to Genesis 24, verse 12, that deals with Eliezer, um, who was the uh, manservant, if you will, um, looking for a, a, a wife for um, the patriarch's um, son. So he was instructed to go to the homeland and find the right bride, if you will, um, for, um, for Isaac. So there the word appears by Yomer Ain. He talked. God, he's praying to God, God, give me inspiration to find the right kind of person. I'm not sure how I can do that. So the question is, on that there is a shalshelet. Why? Well, there is a belief, by the way, we don't know, the name Eliezer does not appear in the Torah, but we know the title that he had in the family, so we know who it was. So we know that uh, Eliezer was very, very important in the household. If he brought home a bride, that would mean there would be another person around, there would be children, and his position might be reduced as being the number one man in the operation. Also, he had a daughter. Perhaps he thought, if I don't bring home someone, perhaps my daughter will be the choice. So whoever decided to put that shall shell it at that location obviously had two different views or had other views. What was his reasoning for the talk and the words that he made to God? The third area we go to is um, Genesis 39.8, and we deal with Joseph. Here, I think we have one much easier to understand the fact pattern. Joseph is in the household of, of Potiphar. Potiphar's wife um, makes a big pass on him, but it's even more than a big pass. I think the words are, come lie with me. The Torah has the phrase, but he refused. Somebody put a shall shell it on that. And uh, I think I grasp that. Because under those circumstances, uh, Joseph had to make a decision. Um, the situation was certainly perfect under the circumstances. They were alone. Nobody would know. Um, but he made the decision and said no. But the Shalshel, it says that he probably um, was in a state of flux as to whether to or whether not to. So one has to think that through and can analyze all those positions. The last is in Leviticus, chapter 8, verse 33, where the Shalshelet appears after Moses is in the process of anointing Aaron to become the high priest and his sons to be the high priests as well. And he brings forth the ram of ordination. Now, we all know who Moses was, the key man, the head man. And we know who Aaron was and the, the sources that he went through throughout his life. But at this particular moment, it was the moment of anointing Aaron and making him the high priest. And he slaughters. The word slaughters has the shall shell it on it. So how does that fit? Why would that be? We know from the Torah that Moses was the most humble person ever. And that was a great character trait of his. And we know all that he did. But at the moment that he slaughtered, if he slaughtered it, the uh, sources also have some that say that Aaron did the slaughtering back and forth. But when he slaughtered it, he knew at that moment that he was giving the priesthood to Aaron, something that perhaps he really wanted for himself. Um, because that was something that was generational. That went on forever and ever. Moses' children have no place as far as our historical development is concerned. The house of Aaron has it through the sons and through the priesthood. So there was a moment of hesitation and, uh, 
ambivalence at the time that Moses did the actual um, slaughtering of that, uh, of that animal. So we learn the words are clear as a bell, but how they're applied in the definition part of it is brought to our attention through the use of a shal shalit um, note. The shal shalit note sounds like this. Exactly as the words appear on the screen. So ladies and gentlemen, I suggest to you that if you have an interest in this, it's worthwhile checking it out because it'll only take you about 25 hours to um, read all the different views. And then I guarantee you that almost all of you will add your own view to that. Thank you very much, Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach, Yasher Kawach, and thank you. First of all, Frank, I understand it's also not only Erev Shavuot, but it's the Erev of, of your birthday. So Yom Huledet Sameach to you. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. And then let me, um, let me just add something to what you're saying or put some, overlay it with something. And that is this. Um, the Shal Shalit was obviously put into the text much later than when the text was written. So whomever was doing that was, was saying something not just about what was going on there, but I think teaching something to the reader, teaching something to all of us, to the congregation of Israel. And that's and what I would say is, first of all, I think you you nailed it, but I think perhaps it's giving us permission, as people who connect to religion, as religious people, to say at times we are ambivalent, that we don't have to be certain all the time, and certainty is often very dangerous. So being being given permission for uncertainty, for ambivalence, is probably a very healthy thing. Because that's the way human beings have to live, that we don't have to, as opposed to other faith traditions, by the way, where you have to be certain with what you believe and what you interpret and what you say, here there's room for the nuance and room for the ambivalence. And that's a real, I think you did a great job with it. Thank you. Yeah. And happy birthday. Yashikala. So the next, uh, our next teachers are Sandra and Richie Bur Richard Birdie. Um, they asked to do this because of their own experience um, with the scribing process. And specifically, as you see, it's with the letter Ayin. And what I, um, what I want to tell you is that they were amongst the last people to scribe up until this point. We'll have more scribing days. But I know that they were so touched by the experience that they wanted to bring it to this moment at our Tikkun. So Sandra and Richie, Richard, you guys are on. Oh, uh, okay. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm a little bit nervous because I've never done anything like this, but I did want to share. We did want to share our experience uh, when we wrote in the Torah last Wednesday. We were given the letter of Ayin, which means I, and that was very, very meaningful to us. And uh, I would like to give you a little background uh, of this. The Hebrew word for I is also iron. So just from the name of this letter, we can understand that it symbolizes the word of light, the world of light. However, it does not only refer to regular physical sight. According to the wisdom of the Kabbalah, through regular physical sight, we can reach an internal and spiritual form of sight. The biblical and literal Hebrew a spring is a ma ma'ani, is also an ion. If, it, if one looks at the spring from afar, it reflects the sky and appears if it, as if it is seeing, the, is seeing the view. It teaches us about creativity and thinking outside the box. The ion, I, I refers to our emotions. According to Western wisdom, the eye also reflects our physical and psychological health. In fact, there is an entire branch of Eastern medicine based on this concept, and it is slowly regaining recognition also 
by the conventional, by conventional medicine. Despite all the benefits of the eye, there is also deterrence. The most prominent of them is the eye that causes people to be jealous of others based on what they see. The numerical value of the letter I in is 70. Scholars point out that there are two words with this collective numerical value. I A in wine and so secret. There is an ancient Jewish idiom that says, when wine goes in, secrets come out. We can understand this from the connection between wine, secrets, and, uh, and the eye. Because the eye desires the wine more than the body needs, more secrets come out. Commentators say that a person who has two eyes, one to see the wonders of creation of the creator and the cosmos, and the other to see the smaller, smallness of himself. However, the word either, blind person, also starts with the letter I in. This is to teach us that the teach us that the fact that we can see doesn't mean that we always understand correctly what we see. This shows just how much physicality can cause us to make mistakes and misunderstand things. Okay. When uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, help scribe the letter in the Torah, I felt a very inspirational moment, but I really didn't think about it too much until I got home. And then I really thought about the I, and when you think about it, the I is really, as Henry David Thoreau said, the jewel of the body. Just think of what it would be like if you cannot see something. The rabbi talked about his experiences and what he saw. Well, I think of all the wonderful things that I've seen in my life from uh, the marriage ceremony with my wife, to my children, to my grandchildren. And all these things to me are marvelous. And I really don't think I would have been able to experience them without sight. And also the eye is the only organ, the entire eye, which cannot be transplanted. Okay, we can transplant a hand, we can transplant the liver, we can transplant a heart, a kidney, but not an entire eye. Um, also, there are many things about the eye that I think people take for granted. You know, we see the good, but as one of my rabbis once said, this too shall pass. So we also see the ugly and we see the bad. We see the good in terms of the wonders of the world, the nature. We see the good when we go on a, on a walk and we see birds and we see different things. Uh, when we spend time at a beach, which we're lucky enough to have. And we see the bad and the ugly when we think of the Shoah and we think of uh, the presently the Ukraine war. Uh, I leave you with this thought, and that is that Shakespeare said that the eye is the window to the soul. And when we think about the soul, okay, we have great meaningful experience. To me, a soul is someone who is good and a mensch. And the word iron interestingly enough, uh, also uh, refers to somebody who is good hearted, uh, somebody who may even have a Y in their, in their name, is somebody who wants to do good in the world. And also most likely a teacher like my wife and I were, or a scribe, or uh, someone else, okay? so. Thank you for this opportunity. And although we didn't have a Torah text, we explained how we felt 
at this particular moment and what it did for us. And hopefully everyone will take care of their eyes. Yashi Kochachem, and thanks to the two of you. And by the way, I think you did have a Torah text because we understand that a text is not as we see already. It's not necessarily a, a narrative, a paragraph, a pasuk, a verse, or a word. It can also be a letter. And what we've learned from some of our teachers, also it can be the spaces between letters. So the Torah is so rich in teaching and continues to you know, emerge and to, to grow. And as uh, Frank told us, even in, the, even in the trope, we can find text. Our next uh, presenter is Jerry Budney. Jerry's a um, member of our executive committee of the board of the synagogue and serves us very well and has done so for so, so many years, but addition is a regular at services and one of our learners. Jerry's part of a small group of people who've been learning together for many years in a class, and then they decided that it wasn't enough what we offered, um, and they have their own um, their own chavura that meets uh, together on, I think it's on Friday, Thursday Friday, morning or Friday, Friday mornings, Friday morning. um, and they teach each other. And that's a really, it's a, it's a wonderful way to learn. We know it's such a critical um, ele- a way of learning throughout our Jewish tradition. So Jerry, I'm proud of you as a learner and a leader, and uh, you bring an important text that for many, for a long time, seemed to be totally irrelevant and has taken on great meaning over the last few years. So it's all yours. Thank you, Rabbi. And that is what I wanted to talk about. The the text is uh, chapter 13 of the book of Vayikra, Leviticus, which is Parshat Tazria. Um, And before we were stricken with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, as the rabbi indicated, this parsha had little relevance to me or to many other people. Uh, indeed, it was notoriously difficult parsha for B'nai Mitzvahs to comment on in their Devar Torah speeches because it superficially appeared to only describe, albeit in vivid detail, certain antiquated skin diseases that afflicted our ancestors thousands of years ago. However, in Parsha Tazriya, the Torah devotes substantial space to the diagnosis and containment of these contagious diseases. The Torah does so because it recognizes the importance of preventing one person's affliction from spreading to others and thereby turning it into an epidemic infecting the entire Israelite community. As a result, in this Parsha, the Torah directs that anyone with certain described symptoms must be reported to the high priest or to one of his sons. The priest must then personally inspect the person's symptoms and use his expertise to determine whether the person is pure, tahor, and does not pose a risk of infecting others, or whether the afflicted person is definitely impure, tameh, and therefore must instead be isolated from the rest of the community outside the Israelite camp. However, it's significant to me that isolation is required not only for people whom the priest has determined definitely have been afflicted with a highly contagious disease, and therefore in verse 46 of this parsha are required to live outside the Israelite camp, but temporary isolation within the camp is also required in other verses of this chapter for those whose symptoms create uncertainty over whether or not they are impure by having been afflicted with the contagious disease. So in verses four to eight, 21 to 23, 26 to 28, and then again in 31 to 37 of this chapter 13, there are descriptions of four different skin conditions which create uncertainty as to whether or not the afflicted person is contagious. The result of such uncertainty is to mandate that the afflicted person be temporarily isolated from the community for seven days while remaining in the camp until the priest can then re-examine them to make a more definitive diagnosis as to whether the person is impure and must be isolated outside the camp, as stated in verse 46, or whether the person is pure and therefore no longer must be isolated because they do not pose a risk of infecting others. I was struck by the obvious analogy, as Rabbi indicated, to the COVID-19 pandemic that confronts us today. 
it doesn't matter if a person exhibiting the described symptoms does or does not feel ill, or if they disagree with the priest's diagnosis. If a priestly's authorities determine the existence of even a potentially contagious skin disease, then the Torah mandates that the person must be isolated, at least temporarily within the Israelite camp, to reduce even the risk of disease spreading to others. I believe that this teaching in Parshat Tazr Tazriya should be applied today to determination by scientific authorities, whether temporary isolation through compliance with mask, social distancing, and quarantine mandates is needed to reduce even the risk of further spreading the contagious COVID disease. This Parsha, which previously had little meaning for me and for many others because of the erroneous view that it was addressing only antiquated leprosy diagnosis with no effect on our lives today in Boca Raton, I now see as teaching us how we should respond to isolation measures prescribed by scientific authorities that even potentially could reduce the risk of our perpetuating the COVID-19 pandemic today. It must have been difficult for the Israelites with the described skin symptoms for whom the priest could not yet make a definitive diagnosis as to whether or not their symptoms re reflected the presence of the contagious disease to nonetheless isolate themselves from family and friends in the Israelite camp for seven days until a definitive diagnosis could then be made. But the Torah mandated that they do so anyway. Similarly, it's difficult for us today when we may have been exposed to someone infected with COVID but have not yet been able to obtain through COVID testing, a determination as to whether or not we've been infected by that exposure to comply with mask, social distancing and quarantine mandates described by science, prescribed by scientific authorities. But the Parsha teaches us that the difficulties inherent in such COVID isolation measures should not deter us from complying with them until a definitive diagnosis can be made through COVID testing. So as a result of all of this, this chapter of Tazria is, uh, unlike it used to be, is now included among my favorite texts because it provides yet another example of how our Torah written thousands of years ago continues to teach us lessons that we can and should apply to our lives today. Thank you. Very yeah. well done and very thoughtful. And I'm glad there's a new interest in, um, Parshat Tazria, some of you may know that Tazria Mitzor are important to me because of my bar mitzvah anniversary. But more than that, I think that one of the great teachings that we find in it has to do with how the priest was involved in diagnosis and in fact, allowing the infected one to come back to the camp. And it speaks to the importance of the individual who reaches out and the healing being a process that's physical, but it's also emotional and psychological and spiritual. And so in that, then a very ancient text also is real, but I think you hit on really important points there, Jerry, thanks. Uh, during the course of this year, <clears throat> as we started this, the Torah project, the scribing project, we thought it would be a really good opportunity to have people in our congregation who are learners and people who have been engaged in this process in one way or, the, or another, to do what we refer to as a Torah minute. And so every week on, in our Friday mailing emails that we receive from the synagogue, there was a Torah minute that came from somebody who was connected to this project. And it was an opportunity for them to learn and for them to teach. Michelle Goodwin is going to share her Torah minute from Parshat Bo. So Michelle, thanks for participating and it's all yours. So I'm, I'm an... I'm a new student. Uh, I've been studying with Rabbi Steinhardt on uh, Fridays. Um, uh, and I've taken some Melton classes. So I'm pretty short and sweet on this. Um, I didn't do anything new. It was a, a big deal for me to do this Torah minute. So I did change it a bit. So at the beginning of the year, I participated in the Torah Minute Project, and on January 7th, I went live. My Torah Minute was about Parsha Bo. In this Parsha, God brings the final three plagues on the Egyptians. The Israelites leave Egypt and receive the commandment to observe Pesach. 
The week before we had read Vaera, when the first seven plagues are called down on the Egyptians. Plagues, isn't that our life today? In my Torah minute, I mentioned the coronavirus. And now sadly, I must add the Ukrainian war, out of control, control gun violence and inflation. You all know I could go on and on. Not just Jews, but all human beings are faced with modern plagues that none of us have the answers to. Like the Israelites, I pray that we too will come through our modern plagues and that in the not so distant future, we will be able to go forth and not have to worry about spreading a virus, a war or getting gunned down while doing a very mundane chore. At the beginning of Genesis, we read Lech Lecha. Lech means go and Bo means come. Rabbi Mark Angel, who is the Rabbi Emeritus of Congregation Sharit Israel in New York City said, and I quote, Lech challenges us to break from the status quo, to move in new directions and to undertake great challenges. Bo reminds us to stay the course, not to lose heart, and not to surrender to frustration and setbacks. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach and Yashar Kocheich, Michelle. Thanks for participating in this. And it's wonderful to have you as a contributor to this whole process of learning that we are, so many of us are doing together. Um, I think every one of us feels a certain personal growth every time we learn, and that's really important. The realization that all of us as learners can also be teachers, every one of us. One does not have to have a degree, one does not have to be ordained as a rabbi to be a teacher um, amongst us is so important. Just as the capacity to teach each other in a group such as the one that Jerry studies with the, the, in that particular Chavura allows all of them to learn from each other and to teach each other. And maybe that's uh, an essential part of not maybe, that is an essential part of Jewish learning. Helene Yentis is going to teach us about Rabbi Kiva's teaching about the Hebrew calendar. Helene, are you there? Do we have Helene? Yes. Can you hear me? Can hear you, can't see you. Are you, uh, whoever is handling the Zoom, can you put Helene up? Helene up? There you are. Okay. I I see your screen, not your face. I don't know if that's purposeful. Is that no, purposeful? it isn't. Wait just one second. There you are. Here I am. Welcome. Okay. So can we move the screen up a little bit so we can see? There we go. That's just perfect. And if I move, if I move my arrow, can you see where I'm moving it? No. Okay. So I need the host to help me out a little bit. She's okay, so, what would you like me to do? Um, I'll just, just I'll direct me, you. and I will move the cursor. Or Allison, make her a co-host, maybe, or allow oh, her to no, she's no, she still won't be able to share my screen. So we screen. I'll That's just, right. okay. I'll just ask you to move it to a certain place. Perfect. But I want to make a few remarks first, and then I want to talk about this piece of artwork. Um, this teaching from Rabbi Akiva about the Hebrew calendar is based on the Torah portion in Genesis 39, 49, where Joseph blesses his sons. And it is also based on the Torah portion that we read this morning, Moses' blessings to the 12 tribes in Numbers. So according to Kabbalah, Sefer Yitzhara, the Jewish calendar is a roadmap for personal transformation. Probably no day is more significant than this day when we stood or we stand at Sinai to receive the Torah. Each year we receive the Torah revelation differently so that we can come closer to whom we are truly meant to be. Every culture in the world has created some way of measuring time, day, night, the seasons, the time to plant, the time to harvest, and special holidays for their own group. Most of these ancient teachings are based on the study of the sun, 
the moon and the stars, astronomy or astrology, if you will. Jews have based their understanding on these notions based on this famous teaching of Rabbi Akiva. He connected the sons of Jacob, or what we call the 12 tribes, in new and unique, in new and unique ways. How do we make time count? And how do we make time holy? Each month is represented by a particular tribe. Although there is some overlap with the Gregorian calendar, such as some of the signs and the dates, there are some unique differences, particularly the addition of a human quality or an area of healing, such as hearing or seeing. Also, there is a connection to a particular biblical narrative, the Hebrew letter and a divine permutation. Each tribe is represented by a color, a flag, a jewel, their specific place in the camp in the desert wanderings, and ultimately where they settled in the land of Israel. We read this, as I said this morning, in the Torah portion on page 744 in Eitzayim. As most of you know, I'm an art historian with some expertise in Jewish art. In fact, mostly that is all I talk about. And studying art is also one of the 70 ways of studying Torah. So this very old teaching of Rabbi Akiva's can be seen in, the earl, in an early extent visual representation of this concept. It is the mosaic floor in the synagogue at Bet Alpha in Beit Shain in Northern Israel. This synagogue was built in approximately 250 of the common era. Perhaps some of you have actually been there. However, tonight, as we finished counting the Omer, I want to speak about a contemporary piece of art. It is simply titled 12 Tribes by Eric Kachura. It is fun, it is upbeat, but it has a very serious undertone. And so I'd like to examine it together. And normally what I would do, and I would have done had we been in person, is I would have asked you questions and we would have been very much more interactive than we can be on the screen. So, Elisa, if you can help me, I want you to point to the center. It looks right there. Okay, so, this is actually a really complicated family tree. So in the center here, we have the eye of God. And the eye of God is represented by Jacob. And then, Elisa, go up and go like around the outer edges of all these things. Go the other way, please. Okay. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. These are all the 12 tribes in their birth order. And okay, so now come back to the eye in the center. Okay. And so you all are familiar. There's lots and lots of stories here. So you know that Jacob had two wives, Rachel and Leah, who are sisters, and two concubines who were like secondary wives, and they also had sons with Jacob. And so now, if you go up to, so this one to the right of the eye, can you point there? Down here, to the right of the eye in the center. Go to the center of the screen again, there. Okay, so this disc represents Leah. And then coming out from this disc, you see that there are six green lines. And now go up to the one right above Leah, right there. 
Okay, so this is Ruben. And before I start to describe some of these symbols, I just want to remind you, some of you are very familiar with them and some of you are not, but they are all around B'nai Torah. They are in the lobby, they're on the ark, they're on the doors as you come in, they're around the top of the room in the wiener, and most importantly, and probably most significantly for congregation B'nai Torah, they are outside right as you drive up to the entrance in the memorial to the winers. So at this image that we are pointing to, this is a mandrake, which is the story of Reuben and sometimes how he is represented. A mandrake is a fertility symbol and the root actually looks like a little man. And the biblical narrative is that Reuben, Rachel has no children and Leah has six sons. And Rachel begs Reuben to give her the mandrakes. And he does in exchange for his mother, Leah, having a night with Joseph. And there are other stories about things that he did. And the interesting part of our patriarchs is none of them is perfect. They all have something good. They all have something bad, but they are still our patriarchs. We are still their descendants. And now go down a little bit to your right there. Okay, this is the story of Shechem and the rape of Dina and the son or the tribe that is represented is Shimeon. And all of you have probably read the book, The Red Tent. And this is um, a representation of that narrative. And it's, it's very interesting that in the ones that are in the wiener, the, the city or the place that is represented looks exactly like the ark in our main sanctuary. Okay, and now come down to the next one beneath that one. Okay, and if we were in the synagogue, I was hoping to show you a breastplate that we have on almost all of the Torahs. Um, and this is the tribe of Levi or the Levites. And he carries a stone or a jewel that represents each one of the 12 tribes. And he wears that breastplate on Yom Kippur when he goes into the Holy of Holies. Okay, and now let's go down to the next one. And I know that we have some lions of Judah and this lion represent Ju represents Judah and who most of us are descended from and King David is a descendant of his and so forth. And so you see these go down to the left now, one to the left right there. Okay, and I told you that each tribe is assigned a particular month. And this month is very interesting. This month is assigned to Zebulun. And Zebulun is a merchant who traveled all over the Mediterranean world. And the astrological sign that we are familiar with in the Gregorian calendar is Gemini, which is twins. And so there are lots of things that I could tell you about them, but one of them is the next one over, but I just wanna stay on the Zebulun one for a minute. 
is Issachar. And these two are always found together. So here you have this idea about knowledge, which is symbolized by the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the astronomers. And the sons of Issachar are the Torah scholars. And so they give their Torah teaching to the sons of Zebulun and the sons and descendants of Zebulun give their money to supporting um, scholars. And they're also with this notion of the twins comes into stark contrast because Jacob and Esau are twins. And it also comes into play in another interpretation with Moses and the two stones of the tablets of the Ten Commandments, the first five really being aimed at Jacob and the second 10, I mean, the second five being aimed at uh, Esau because they're simpler. Okay, moving around this um, circle, we are now at the tribe of Dan and you can see this is a symbol of justice, but now go back up right above the symbol of Dan. Okay, this is Bilha, who is Rachel's concubine, who she gives to have a child with Jacob, but actually it is ascribed to her. And you can see the line connecting these two people is different. And Bilcha is also the mother of another tribe. Go up three to your left to what looks like a deer. Okay, she is also the mother of Naphtali. And in the sanctuary, on the doors of the sanctuary, you see that symbol of this deer or stag running swiftly to be a student of Torah. And just coincidentally, it is also the symbol of the Israeli post office. Come back down to this one underneath the tree. And this is now go back up for the yellow line to this one. Okay, so if Rachel could have children ascribed to her through a concubine, uh, Leah does the same thing with her concubine and the children of Zilpah are Gad and Asher and Gad go down from the first yellow dime under the tree is always on the borders. And these are all kinds of borders. They're the borders between Jew being Jewish, their military borders, their spiritual the borders. But right. this okay. is always on the border. And then there is Asher who gets almost all of the blessings. And then we go up to the top here and we have Rachel who is Jacob's favorite wife. And these are her, her two sons, Joseph who receives all of the blessings and her second son, Benjamin who Rachel dies giving birth to him. So in conclusion, I want to go back to kind of how, for me, what the name B'nai Torah congregation means. B'nai means sons or daughters or descendants, and all of us are descendants of these 12 tribes and when we study Torah and the biblical narratives, we remember them 
in much the same way as we remember a beloved person with a yard site. And congregation goes from being like the 12 tribes, an individual, a nuclear family, a tribe, and when they become slaves in Egypt, they become a people and they become the people of Israel at Sinai and all the generations for all time are present at Sinai to receive the Torah with all of our senses. Thank you and Hag Sameach. I hope you enjoyed this piece that I really love and have always found fascinating. Yashi Kochai, thanks, Helene. That, that was a great presentation. I know that you're, very, as an artist and somebody who's very sensitive to art, you've always been able to uh, learn from and teach from art as the text. In 1973, I was working as a counselor at Camp Ramah, 1973. And that summer, there was a, an, a young artist that came to run the, quote, arts and crafts program. His name was David Moss. And David Moss transformed the entire camp by virtue of the art that he did around the camp. David Moss has gone on to be uh, perhaps the single most important artist of the Jewish people in the 20th century anyway, and especially with his contribution of the Moss Haggadah, that if you don't know it, you really should, um, should look it up and take a look at it. It's just a magnificent piece. We've had him here. But what we learn in this time uh, is that there are ways, there are different types of texts, as I said, and there are different ways that we learn what it means to be Jewish. And there are great Jewish artists in our time right now who are teaching us about our tradition through their crea a creative process of art. <clears throat> our final teacher this evening, Acharon, Acharon Chaviv, as we say, uh, is a, a dear teacher to so many of you and, and honored by so many people in the Jewish world, including so many of our colleagues, so many rabbis and myself. So I'm always honored when uh, Rabbi Jack Reamer um, lends his, uh, his contributions and thought, which are always not only um, very insightful, but always very sensitive to life. So uh, Rabbi Reamer, I, you are on. You have to unmute. Can you unmute? You're still muted. Try the bottom left of your screen. Look at that microphone. Very bottom left of your screen. Okay. Yep, now we got you, thanks. I must tell you, I was asked how long this program is supposed to go. Rabbi Steiner said, up to 8.30. So I don't know if I should talk or not. I want to thank Rabbi Steinhardt and Frank Kreutzer for the very generous things they said about me. I hope you believe them. I hope I don't believe them. Because if I believe them, I will be unfit to live with. You know the story of the man who comes back from a testimonial dinner and everybody says nice things about him? comes back and he says to his wife, how many really great men do you think there are in this world? And she says, I don't know exactly how many, but I'm sure it's one less than you think there are. Before I begin, I gotta tell you, I have had more trouble preparing for tonight's see him than for any other talk in my entire life. Allison can testify for that. I kept changing my mind every day, sometimes two or three times a day. And even now, I'm not sure which stories I'm going to tell. I had trouble for two reasons. First is Rabbi Steinhardt gave me strict orders. He said, under no circumstances are you allowed to speak for five or six hours. And if you do, you'll never be invited to a ticket again. 
But on the other hand, there are so many stories that I want to tell you. And every story came and pulled on my sleeve and said, you're not going to teach me. You're not going to teach me. And so it was hard to choose between them. I finally decided I'm going to tell some love stories that I love tonight. First of all, because Shavuos is a love story. It's the day when God and Israel were betrothed to each other. And the other reason is I've always, since I was a little boy, I've always been interested in the subject of love. I've done research on it. If it were up to me, I would have majored in love at the seminary, but they wouldn't let me. But I'm fascinated by love. And so I'm going to tell you at least a couple of stories about love. One you've heard before, but that's okay. The difference in an ordinary story and a great story it's an ordinary story you hear once and finished. You read it once and it, you're done with it. A great story you read many times. And every time you read it, you find something new in it because you're reading it at a different stage in your life. The first story I'm going to tell you is the story of the man, the rabbi who loved Torah so much that he wanted to move it out of the synagogue. The second is the story of the woman whom I thought was crazy. And the third is the story of the rabbi who was so devoted to his congregation that he would do anything and everything that they needed him to do. Okay, first story. There was a certain rabbi who lived in Boca Raton. He lived at the time when the coronavirus was affecting the whole world. And so he gathered his people together on Shavuos nights and he asked them some basic questions. He said, everybody here belongs to a shul? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, your shul stands for certain values and certain principles. They all said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, I assume everybody in this room has the uh, had at least one vaccination? They all said, yeah. He said, if that's true, would you please tell me what bracha did you say when you got a vaccination? And there was silence in the room. Nobody in the whole room could tell him what bracha they said when they got a vaccination shot. So he told them, he said the bracha he's supposed to say is Bore Refuat, the one who creates healing, the one who invents instruments and medicines. It's found in the morning service, in the chakra service. But you're supposed to say it not just in shul, but whenever you experience Bore Refuat in your daily life. Do you know how many years it takes ordinarily for scientists to come up with a vaccine usually takes many, many, many years. But this time they came up not with one, not with two. They came up with four different drugs in 15 months. And they saved lives by doing that. So we should say, glory before. And we should also be aware they invented Zoom and live stream. Can you imagine what our lives would be like, we'd be stir crazy if we were quarantined and had to stay home and there was no live stream and no Zoom. If they had Zoom and live stream enable us to go to classes, not only in our shul, but wherever and whenever we want to, all over the world. They enable us to run our shuls. They enable us to keep our schools going. They enabled us to sponsor wonderful concerts, even during quarantine. Shouldn't we make a bracha over such a blessing? Shouldn't we even make a bracha over a television? It keeps us from going stir crazy. Can you imagine how empty our lives would have been if we only had the four walls of the living room to look at all night, all day, and didn't have programs to watch? So we ought to make a bracha, not take these 
things for granted. Where to make a bracha? When you get their booster shot. And then he said, I assume everybody in this room wears masks. And all, yeah, 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 we all do. He said, what bracha did you recite when you put on a mask? And again, there was silence in the room. Nobody connected putting on a mask with making a bracha. This is one world and that's another world. This is what you do outside and this is what you say in the shul. He said, that's, no, no, no. You gotta say a bracha, baruch atah adonai, elohinu melech ha'olam, asher kiddushana b'mitzvah sam, v'tzivano al shmirat gufenu. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who has made us a holy people by means of his mitzvot, and has commanded us to guard our health. And that's a mitzvah, to guard our health. It's in Devarim. And did you notice that I said it in the plural? It's because when you put on a, a mask, you protect me. When I put on a mask, I protect you. If there's anything that this virus has taught us is that we're, our lives are intertwined. What I breathe in, you breathe out. What you breathe in, I breathe out. We're interconnected, intertwined. And therefore, next time you put on a mask, make a breath. And then he asked him one, one more question. When you heard what happened in Buffalo, or in Uvalde, or in Tulsa, which one of the al did you say? Hey, look, what does the Al-Khait have to do with the world in which we live? And he said, them, you should have said, yad, which literally means by strengthening our hand. You know why? You see what that al means? Originally, primitive people could only fight with their hands. And how much damage could you, could you how much could you hurt somebody with your hand? And how many people could you hurt at one time with your hand? And then one after another, after another, after another, we invented more weapons and more sophisticated weapons and more powerful weapons. And we increased the amount of chozik yad in the world. Now a person with the AR-15, whatever they call it, can kill 10 people in 10 seconds. That's how we've strengthened the hand. And for that, we should say, okay, I didn't do it. I didn't kill anybody. Dr. Heschel said, in a free society, some people are guilty. All people are responsible. Because if we created a culture in which guns can be sold online, in shops, by uh, what are they called? Screening or pasting them or whatever they call it now. If we created that kind of a culture, we have to say all things. The point I'm trying to make is, if you love the Torah, don't keep the Torah inside the shul. Anybody can do that. Anybody can daven. That doesn't take much talent. The task is to take the Torah out of the shul and into the world. The task is not to say a bracha a mile a minute in the chakra surface. The task is to say that bracha when you put on a mask, when you get a vaccine shot, to say al take not just in Kippur, to say al take for creating the kind of a world in which we've increased the violence so much. If you really care about the Torah, you got to take the Torah out of the show. That's the first thing I want to say to you. Let me tell you a story that you know about a woman who, if she'd asked me what to do, I would have told her, don't. And I, if she did it and I heard about it, I would have said, this woman is crazy. There's a story that you all know the story we're going to read tomorrow in Shul, 
the story of a family that lived in Bethlehem and left Israel because there was a famine there. And they moved to Moab. And after they settled down in Moab, they married, the, the husband died. And then the two sons, who had both married Moabite women, also died. So the three widows are left. Naomi decides to go back to Israel. And she says to her two daughters-in-law, you stay here. This is where you belong. You know the language, people know you, you know them. You, you fit in here. Why would you, in your, why would you go with me? What are you gonna do in Israel? You don't know the language. You don't know the customs. You don't know the religion. People are gonna be suspicious of you because you come from Moab. Stay here. If Ruth, Orpah listened, she stayed. Ruth insists on going. Let me ask you, if Ruth had come to you or me for advice, should I go or not, what would you have told her? I would have said, you gotta be crazy. To go to a land where you don't belong? To go to a land that you don't understand? Just because you love your mother-in-law? Is that a reason? I would have told her to stay home. Look how the story ends. She goes, she meets a guy, also a widower. They fall in love, they get married. And four generations later, they produce David, king of Israel, the ancestor of the Messiah. And by the way, on the other side, David's related to a, a woman, how shall I say this, not of great repute. Judah has two sons. He marries them both to a woman named Tamar. They both die. He says, this woman's a jinx. I'm not gonna give her my third child. So he says, you go home. When he's old enough, we'll call you. Don't call us, we'll call you. And she realizes very soon that he's not gonna call her. So she does something very bold. She meets him on the road where he's going to a party to a harvest. She comes in disguise and looks like a prostitute. So he propositions her and she says, yes. And he reaches and he left his wallet at home. He left his credit cards at home. So he says, I'll give you my staff as collateral you can hold on. And then, then you, you know, you, you'll, you'll show up with that staff and I'll give you, I'll give you the, the payment I owe you. Two months later, word gets out, she's pregnant. And he's happy to hear that. Now I can get rid of this woman once and for all. She's a not nice lady, we're gonna execute her. And she says, okay, but I want you to know just you, where I got, to, who I had relationship with. I want you to see what I got for collateral. And when he sees it, he understands she didn't do this for money. She didn't do this to be married. She did it for him so that he would have an heir so that the Jewish people would continue. He says, she's better than I am. And he marries her. And that's David's ancestor on the other side. So the Mashiach on both sides is descended from people like this. What are the lessons that you and I should learn from this story? I think there are two lessons. Number one, there are some moments in everybody's life. I'm sure everybody in this room has had such a moment. When you don't know what to do, you stand at the crossroads. Should I, shouldn't I? At that point, the example of Ruth says, yeah, do it. There are some times when logic be damned. There are some times when you have to listen to your heart and not listen to your head. She cared enough about Naomi. I don't care that I'll be an old maid there. I'm gonna go with Naomi. So that's the first lesson. 
Whenever you stand at a crossroads, do what your heart tells you to do, not what your head tells you to do. And the second lesson is even more interesting. She was the widow, Boaz was the widow. It was the second marriage for both of them. And I'm addressing this to anybody in this room who's ever had a second marriage or more. The temptation when you come to a second marriage is I'm not, no, no, I'm not gonna do it. Because you're either bitter from the fact that the first marriage didn't work out, he died on me, or we didn't get along. You're either bitter that the first marriage didn't work out, or you're cynical, or you're warped. And so if the first act, first marriage is an act of faith, truth is you don't know who you've married until the way up the wedding aisle. You can date for a month, you can date for a year. You don't know who you're really marrying until you're the way up the wedding aisle. But a second marriage is a bigger act of faith. Second marriage is, I know that I failed the first, I'm going to try it again. To have that kind of resilience and that kind of courage and that kind of faith in the future, that's the lesson. She wasn't crazy. That's the lesson you learn from Ruth. And I recommend it to all the people who've had tough first marriages. Even if they were tough, even if they ended badly, worth trying again. Third story, I only, I cut the list of possible stories I wanna tell you down from 50 to 40 to 30 to 20. Hard to cut below 20, but I'll try. But this is the third story. And I tell it to you for two reasons. It tells you what it means to be a devoted rabbi. And it solves a problem that many people have had on Shavuos. Why do we eat dairy? Once upon a time, there was a rabbi in Boca very devoted to his people. Once somebody called him while he was eating dinner, said, Rabbi, can I talk to you? All right, he said, sure. And he put away his dinner and said, what's going on? And the guy said, my wife and I are having a big fight. She goes according to her mother, who says the reason you eat dairy on, on Shavuos is because they had not yet, or just learned the laws of kashras, and they weren't uh, sure yet how to do it, how to do meat. And I learned from my mother that they did it because they were going into the land of milk and honey. And that's why they wanted milk sticks. And we've been fighting and fighting and fighting. And if we don't get the answer, I'm not sure that our marriage is gonna work out. The rabbi said, leave it to me, I'll get the answer hangs up, doesn't eat the rest of his supper, goes, takes a cab to the airport, flies to New York. In the morning, he, the Jewish Theological Seminary Library opens, he's the first in line. The great library. And he looks through all the books in the library and all the manuscripts in the library. And most of them don't deal with this question. And the ones that deal with this question, Four agree with his mother, and four agree with her mother. He says, thank you very much, leaves the seminary, gets into a cab, flies to the air, goes to the airport, and flies to Israel, and goes to visit the Hebrew University Library, one of the great libraries in the world. First in line when it opens up, and he reads shelf by shelf by shelf by shelf, no answer. One or two are on his mother's side, one or two on the father, her mother's side, no answer. Gets out of the library, hails a cab, and goes to the airport and flies to Rome. And when the Vatican Library, which is one of the great libraries, opens up the next morning, he's there. And he goes through shelf by shelf by shelf, the whole Vatican library, and he finds the answer. 
finds the answer in a book at the bottom of the last shelf. He finds the real reason. Written in Latin, translated from the French, translates it into English, and heads for home. The story of what happened in the French village of Troy. T R O Y E S, not sure exactly how you pronounce this. And uh, the smartest man in, in the whole city was a guy named Rashi, Shlomo son of Yitzchak. He had a wine business on the side, but he was a great, great scholar. He was probably the second greatest scholar, most second most brilliant person in the whole town. I'll tell you who the most brilliant one was in a minute. He davened in a shul, and the shul gradually grew in size, little by little, more and more tourists retired in, in Troy. So they kept moving the machitza over a little bit each time. Because men have to daven, women don't really have to daven. Finally, they pushed it all the way over to the farthest end. And now there was no room for the women to daven. They came to shul, they couldn't get in. What should they do? They turned to Mrs. Rush, who as I said, I think was the smartest woman in town. And she gave them a lesson. She gave them a study the Torah portion with them while they were in, while the men were inside. It was Pesach. And so she taught them a lesson about how God took the Jews out of Egypt and therefore they're free. And somebody said, free, we're not free. We can't go even get into the shul. She said, I'll take care of it. Soon as the first two days of Yontik were over, she said to her husband, I want you to call a board meeting. And I want you to tell the board, we gotta expand the shul. You gotta have a building campaign. And he listened to his wife. He went to the chairman of the board. Chairman of the board called the board meeting and told them, we gotta have a building campaign. The people on the board were not happy to hear that. They didn't want a building campaign. Cost money. So they said, Let's, you know, how, you know how, how people stall in a shul? They said, let's appoint a committee to study the matter. That's how you get out of it. They didn't, they appointed the committee and the committee never met. The women got on, figured out they're stalling. And so when Shavuos came, the women got an idea. None of them went to shul. When the men came home, when Rabbi Shlomo ben Yitzchak came home, she was sitting, reading, and there was no food on the table. He said, what's going on? He said, I'm reading. What do you mean you're reading? Where's, the, where's, where's lunch? She said, I don't know. Um, didn't think about it. He was, what's going on here? He went out, and he found the shul president walking in the street. And then they found the everybody, all the men were in the street with the same story. The women had gone on strike. They were not going to make any lunch until the board of directors appointed a committee. Well, Rapsalva came up, what's he could never be never made lunch for himself in his whole life. And he looked in the refrigerator. And the only thing he could find was peanut butter and bread and jelly. So he made himself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And all the other men did the same. And the next day they appointed the committee, which came out, hired an architect who, who came up with plans and they expanded the shul to double its size so there'd be room for the women. And Rabbi Shlomo Neskai watched this happening he said to himself, I don't know. Who knows what this will lead to? Who knows what they'll want next? They'll want literacy? They'll want the right to vote? They'll want the right to be cantors? They'll want the right to be rabbis? Who can predict what's going to happen? 
but I think we should always eat dairy on this day to remember the lesson that the women taught us. Now I'm gonna, I promise I'm gonna give you the last story. It, this is a document that I suggest we draw up on parchment, sign, and read at the next annual meeting or at Shavuot. On the sixth day of the month of Sivan, which constitutes the first day of Shavuot, in the year 5,782, since the creation of the world, according to our reckoning, which corresponds this year to June 5th, 2022, in the village of Boca Raton, in the county of Palm Beach, in the state of Florida, in the United States of America, we, the family of B'nai Torah, hereby promise as the party of the first part to dedicate ourselves as a community and as individuals to listening to your divine lure represented here today by this holy Torah, just as our mothers and fathers dedicated themselves when they stood at Sinai. We hereby attest that we will act in such a way as to make the words of the Torah come alive, not only in the shul, but wherever we go. And we hope that they will be forever sweet in our mouths, in the mouths of our children, in the mouths of our children, children. And we hope that by to do this by loving, honoring, and cherishing each other, and by respecting the world that you have made. We hereby promise to make of our congregation B'nai Torah a place where Torah lives by forever trying to take its words out of the synagogue and into the world. And by dedicating ourselves to truth and by committing ourselves to deeds of loving kindness and by pursuing the mitzvot, ben adam lemakom u ben adam lechavero, those laws between men and men and between men and women and between men and God, which you have given us. We hereby promise to act as friends, defending each other, speaking sympathetically to each other, supporting one another in time of sadness, challenge, or distress, and rejoicing with each other in time of good fortune, and begrudging nobody his happiness or his success. And we promise to take this covenant between you and us seriously. We promise to support one another, to act with forgiveness, integrity, compassion. We promise to be guided by the teachings of the Torah. We promise to try to be linked to the Jewish people's past, present, and future. This holy covenant of marriage shall this day be signed and sealed just as it once was signed and sealed in the wilderness. It is hereby reaffirmed by a vibrant, active, caring Jewish community and may it remain an eternal covenant. To this let us all say, Ah, uh, ah, uh, let's all say Amen. together, Amen. 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 May it really be so. May we Amen. take the Torah Amen. out of the synagogue. Big deal to have a Torah in the synagogue. Take it out into the world and live by it there so we know what bracha to say for putting on a mask or for getting a vaccine shot 
or what all fates is say. for what happens. Thank you. Shalom. Tadaraba. Thank you. You uh, truly, uh, Rabbi Reamer, Jack, you truly are Moreno Virabenu. You are our teacher and you are our rabbi, a rabbi to so many. You know, I've been reading uh, Rabbi Reamer's sermons for about 44 years. Before there was the internet, I would get a, uh, a monthly mailing of sermons from rabbinical assembly uh, rabbis. I was still in school and I always, always turned immediately to Rabbi Reamer's sermons. And the reason was because his sermons were about life and love and relationships, family relationships, community relationships. And they were about, his sermons were about the, the, the call for us to take Torah away outside of the sanctuary into our lives and into our world. So in that way, you haven't changed. But in other ways, you, uh, your message continues to grow. And we are all uh, the recipients of that and very grateful for that. Before we close, there's a couple things that I want to do. I want to tell a story. It's a story about a very, very dear friend of Rabbi Reamers and myself, a friend who was, um, I believe, his, uh, his, uh, his chavrusa in rabbinical school. And he was truly my Rebbe in my rabbinical school days and remained so for many years. He was the rabbi who installed me up in a Torah 29 years ago, Rabbi Morty Leifman. The story is the following. I think it was around June 4th or 5th that I was ordained in 19, um, 1982. And um, I was driving from the Upper West Side where I lived to the east side of Manhattan where the ordination ceremony took place at Park Avenue Synagogue. And as I was driving through the park, through Central Park, I was struck by something and that was I had been in rabbinical school for six years, and I felt like I knew so little of what had to be learned. And I felt a little bit overwhelmed by that, that reality, because I was going to become a rabbi, and I believed at that point I had to have all the answers for my congregants. I got to Park Avenue Synagogue, and Rabbi Leifman greeted me in the uh, lobby, and he gave me one of his huge hugs that he gave to so many that he was close to. And he said to me, he said, uh, Duvidal was what he called me. He said, you don't look so happy. And I said, I don't feel so happy. I feel a little bit overwhelmed. And in fact, in awe of what I'm about to embark on, I don't feel like I know enough. And he said to me, that may be what will make you a good rabbi. Because none of us know enough that the process of either being a rabbi or being a Jew is a process of ongoing learning, continue to learn more and more. None of us will know everything ever. Um, later on in my career, more recently, when I became a, a student of Rabbi David Hartman's, I remember uh, Hartman telling a group of rabbis that when you go home uh, to your congregants, learn with them. Don't always teach them or preach at them but learn together because everybody has questions, including rabbis. Seeing what we have developed here at B'nai Torah gives me great pride for just that reason. Because, and as this night reflected, we are all learners and we are all teachers. Tomorrow morning, our service will begin at 9 a.m. and it will include a teaching about the Book of Ruth by one of our congregants, as well as the reading from Ruth by a number of our congregants. And then on Monday morning, we'll gather again at 9 a.m. and that service will include Yiskor. Because when we were together, we had promised cheesecake. We have lots of cheesecakes, which will be at Kiddush tomorrow and uh, Monday. So if you can join us, please do so. The rains have finished and we're, uh, we're expecting pretty good weather tomorrow. Let's conclude with the following, and I ask the cantor to join me with this. In our Sidur between the Shabbat Sidur between Kabbalah Shabbat and Marif, we find a bunch of teachings, and on page 27 in the Sidur, we find a very well known passage from the Gemara from Brachot Amar Rabbi El Azar, Amar Rabbi Chanina. 
Rabbi Elazar taught in the name of Rabbi Hanina. Tamidei chachamim marbin shalom ba'olam. Peace is increased by the disciples of the sages. Wise teachers increase, wise uh, students increase peace in this world. Shene amar v'chol banayich limudei Adonai v'rav shalom banayich. When all of your children are taught of Adonai, great will be the peace of your children. The cantor will continue with uh, the end of this little sugya, this end of this passage. Uh, I believe she'll begin with uh, Laman Achai, maybe Yehi Shalom. Cantor? Yehi Shalom Bechelech Shalva Be'armenot Yehi Shalom Bechelech Shalva Be'armenot Ha'ich Yehi Shalom Bechelech Shalva Be'armenot Ha'ich Yanana grant his people strength. May God bless his people with peace. Thank you very much to everybody who participated. Thank you for all of you for being on this evening. I wish you a Chag Sameach, a good Yantiv, and look forward to seeing you all uh, very soon. Have a good evening. Erev Tov, thanks. And I want to thank, well, one last thing. I thank Allison um, and Elisa for their work in um, putting uh, putting all the structure to this this evening. So thank you very much to all of you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Great program. Thank you. Great Great program. Program. Wonderful. Wonderful program. Thank you Wonderful. so much. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. Outstanding. Excellent. Thank you. Are we, are we getting like like cheesecake delivery now or no? tomorrow? <laughs> I wish it's tomorrow. Okay. I wish I could deliver it to all of you. That would be a really uh, nice can, touch. Can, but... Can't your Magda. Yeah, yeah you should know that uh, in synagogue life, the one who gives, who asks the question, gets to do the work. Oh, <laughs> no problem. But after Shavuos, because I cannot order in Shavuos. As after long as, as as long as I made you smile, that's all that counts. After Thank every you. fourth speaker, <laughs> after every fourth speaker, 
on the 15 hours that we would daven until 6.30 in the morning, we expected to have at least another dozen donuts. After seven hours, we'd have to have a lox bagel, a all season bagel, a, a chocolate bagel. What, what has happened here, Ed? <laughs> you know, Frank, actually, Yair told me today that today is the National Donut Day? Absolutely. Oh, yes, absolutely. Only in America. <laughs> Wait, Rabbi, is there a bracha oh, for that? You terrific. Thank you. Where's Everyone Rabbi Rima when we need him? <laughs> Good night, all. Thanks, Good night, all. Thanks. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a perfect program. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Rabbi, Stein, Rabbi Steiner. Yeah, uh, you, I, you've been adding uh, when you do the uh, prayer for the sick people. Yeah. Uh, for good health, you've been adding people with mental illness and other issues. Yes. I have to tell you that is probably one of the most beautiful things that you've been doing. Uh, in addition, so uh, to me, that's like uh, uh, the reason why I'm mentioning it today is because that's the continuation of the oral law. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think it's just magnificent because everybody has something they don't even realize they have a, an issue. Yeah. And I think it's wonderful that you added that. Yes, Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Good Thank you. 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 Thank you.